Well, it was very clear. Thanks, everybody. <coughs> to the students graduating and about to be thrown into uh, the uh, lion's den. What you've gotten is all the practical stuff. And for those that have been out there for a long time, uh, you know, you think you have the practical. What I want to do is some of the truths, some of the, the quick top ten things that you don't learn at HBS, uh, that you may not learn through your first business, that may not seem intuitive, but hopefully will get you to a decision quicker and how to build your business faster. And as you saw from the esteemed questions from the judges tonight, Everybody focuses on the same things. It doesn't matter what the business is. You need to communicate it in the same way to be successful. And so, um, I got the right button. Oh, I'll be I'll be tweeting against myself. Those in the in the cheap seats will be able to read them at the bottom. I think that saves you guys tweeting um, from where you are. Uh, so, uh, two seconds of background because what good is advice unless you know the source. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've taken stakes in 70 odd companies and had roll ups, had taken companies public. Uh, no investor has lost money with me in 30 years of doing this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, hired the uh, first guy to write the first auction that became uh, eBay. We started LinkedIn, those are some of the big ones. First video on a computer. Um, First, one of the first social uh, networks, and Ubu, which I presently run, is now at 70 million users. We're adding 100 to 200 thousand people a day. Uh, Skype is a fantastic 10-year-old technology, um, but now people want to have HD quality, have it not freeze, and free is great. We do almost a billion and a half minutes of video a month, so the business model is advertising. We have more viewers than Fox in most days. Uh, and one of our big advertisers happens to be television. We can ship a million people to watch whatever TV show by hitting them on the board in real time. So that's my background, and I've spent most of my time at the intersection between Silicon Valley and Hollywood, so I am the mayor of Sillywood. So, um, so that's me. So let me start with the real basic thing which comes to any pitch in any time. Keep it simple, stupid. You've heard it before, but you tend to forget it. Your audience, for the most part, when you're going out to raise money and start your business, is not in the same demographic. They do not have the same expertise. They are not cooks. They are not uh, urban planners. They are people that made their money in some arcane business that may or may not still exist. Okay? But you need to communicate. In the first half of my career, when I was starting these new businesses that seemed so obvious, and why did the people that dictate email get it? Um, I thought it was their fault. As I joined the gray hair crowd, what I realized was my failure to communicate in a way that they could comprehend. So, the businesses that are most successful really have to have something that radically changes the market as it is, usually around technology. Um, a demographic can change the aging of America, uh, the fact that if you look at Los Angeles, 42% were born in another country. I mean, demographics can also change it. But at the end of the day, your big multinational corporations are too busy self-sustaining what they're in to go after new emerging niches. And that's where you're best <coughs> likely to plant your seed, have time to grow, and if you can grow to side, sell out to those people or in the right market conditions to become public. So a great example is Instagram. Let me give you Instagram the pitch that anybody would have liked the idea. So the guy who originally pitched it, oh, we want to make uh, taking pictures fun. Doesn't sound like a business. I don't know how I'm going to monetize. Still doesn't sound like a business. If I told you that last year, more than 50% of the photos taken in the history of mankind in 150 years of photography, more than 50% of all photos were taken last year, there's a fundamental change. And Instagram made every fool feel like an artiste by having filters to make their photos look good. <coughs> if I also told you that Facebook was going to be going public and social gaming was no longer the number one use in Facebook, but looking at photos was, you suddenly see that you have one buyer highly motivated to make sure that they continue to have photos be there. You only need one buyer at the end of the day to sell your business, and that's the Instagram story. So very, very simple. 
right time, right place. You can start the business knowing that the world will change the way it did. But once it does, you can magnify, get the attention, and, and have the happy ending. For most businesses and for most things that you go out and pitch, revenue is what it's about. You don't necessarily have to have revenue day one. You may be building your audience, but you better have what that model is. Because for most businesses, they underestimate the cost of getting a customer, keeping that customer, and creating it. So just because you see a market void, one of the most common problems is, I see a new opening in the market. I'm going to go after it. Well, that's value creation. You're creating value out there. But unless you can figure out how to defend that, you're not getting value captured. You're not going to see the return on your reward. You're just going to be out there. So the best way to do it is incentivize everybody aligned in your company, no matter whether they're a graphic cards program or whatever, all tied to some aspect of interpreting your key performance indicators. If you can get through a pitch and not say KPIs, you're not going to get money. You need to figure out how you can tie in that everybody's goal at the end of the day drives that revenue. And if you can show that, then you can test very small and then extrapolate very large off of that. And that's how a little startup like uh, Groupon, while they're private, could get $850 million in cash. They extrapolated to an insane degree and it didn't actually pay off. Um, so that's, that's really job one. And if you don't focus on that in your pitch, you're pitching to the wrong people. Because the people that are giving you money would like to get it back. And so that's really what they're focused on um, at the beginning. Next thing is, most people don't like surprises. It's the basis of investing. It's nice when you have a home run that absolutely goes insane, but most people want to see a business that can be forecast and built quarterly, because you're going to be spending money that needs to be forecast. They need to know what your burn rate is. They need to know what your expenses are going to be. So you better pretty much know what your revenues are going to be. Hit-driven businesses are the hardest to fund. I've got a cool video game. Well, it might be good, it might not be good. By the time you find out you spent all the money and you have nothing but either a hit or a flop, there's no, well, I got a sort of okay video game. Um, and to hit home run after home run after home run, virtually impossible to do. So really figure out how you're going to go after steady growth. So when you looked at some of the examples tonight, if you went after a number of the judges talked about going after a niche market, and the reason was to figure out what's your customer acquisition cost in that market, what did you learn that worked, and how do you target the next niche, and the next niche, and the next niche. And I'll give you an insight on, on Ubu, which uh, grew without any marketing to the first 50 million, and then we really started looking at where the heavy usage was and where to start spending marketing to get now to uh, uh, the next uh, uh, 50 million. And what was interesting is we noticed that there was a demographic divide in who was using us versus Skype or FaceTime. And the shocker for us, it was ethnic. We over-index on Hispanics. We over-index on African Americans. Technology is technology. What's the difference? Well, Twitter over-indexes on African Americans compared to Facebook. The difference was if you lived in the suburbs, you had an iProduct. Your friend had an iProduct. Everybody had an iProduct. Let's just all FaceTime. If you lived in an urban area, some people had a Mac, some had a PC, some had an Android. It was whatever, but everybody wanted to communicate. We were the only platform that worked that way. So once we figured out where our base was, that's where we started marketing. And the great thing about when you know your business, and this is the difference between your business plan and when you get into your business, you'll have insights that no one else has. That is like the Colonel's secret sauce. You know something that nobody else has. We were the only people marketing that in that community. And what was surprising about it is that's where texting took off. It took off in the clubs. It took off in hip hop. Okay, the sidekick came out. You couldn't talk in a club. Texting made sense. Went from there to Paris Hilton, and next thing you know, you know, old guys on, on Wall Street uh, can't, can't drop their crackers. Um, so we followed the same pattern, going, going uh, where we saw strength. Subaru, all lesbian following. I mean, different products have different different markets that just come and and and, and follow it. So 
That's really what we have to do. Because PCs, at the end of the day, want a business that can be tracked. If you can track and you can hit your projections time and time again, they'll line up around the block and give you money. My last company uh, that, that I uh, sold out my stake, we took it from 5,000 uniques a month to 600 million uniques a month in 18 months. It was month after month of just beating those numbers. Okay? Not only did we line up the capital that we needed, we actually lined up debt from banks of $20 million to have a credit line. And we were able to hammer them on not securing it with anything, you know, owners, uh, like firstborn. Um, so, so really build a predictable business. Number eight, and this is what we were talking about before. There's all kinds of growth. You want good growth. One of the common mistakes that you see in a world where SEO is just a numbers game is you can buy app installs. You can have a million app installs. In, in my old business, we were, we were paid by, by uh, Microsoft to get likes on Facebook. We got Bing a million likes in a day. So they could put out a press release that Bing is more popular than Google. <laughs> I made a lot of money on that, but I don't think anybody believed it. So at the end of the day, you want good growth. You want growth that you can defend. Have some piece of the market that you can truly say is yours and that the barrier to entry isn't just ephemeral. So in our case, what we focused on is we wanted to answer the question, how does Ubu make you feel? That you feel something about the brand, that you feel it's fun, it's part of your social life, it's part of communicating. Skype is what you do with Aunt Millie in Paris Thursday at 2 o'clock. Ubu is what you leave open all night and see who stumbles in and what conversations you're going to have and, and take it with you on the go. <coughs> and that proves out that the average user is doing it for 200 minutes a month. So heavy, heavy stickiness. And we knew we were on the right path when Disney came calling and said, uh, you're second only to us with kids. What is it that you're doing? So we held on to a market and let the kids explain to everybody else why it was a better technology. Um, and in any business, getting that customer and acquiring that customer is your most expensive cost that you should ever have in a business. So figure out how to have a repeat customer. You know, the one and done, there's a lot of people on the planet, but it's a really hard way to run a business and not very predictable. Ah, Samet's Law. The first person that you educate in business is your competition. Whatever void you're you're trying to fill, that void is being met. It be, may be in an inefficient manner, an expensive manner, a manner that, that, that you can improve upon, but if you didn't come up with your idea, life would go on on this planet. They're not that important. So that means whoever is looking at that space, is in that space and is doing it wrong, the second you come out, they go, why did I think of that? And in the case of, let's say you have an add-on to Twitter, Twitter will go, wow. Why did we think of that? They'll incorporate that change and shut you down. Or they may buy you and incorporate the change. But you really have to figure out what's something that you can do that you can defend. Which brings us to know your limits. You can't go after everything. I'm sure everybody watched this. Great marketing for Red Bull, amazing. But the moment that, that got me to the edge of my seat of a crazy guy all alone outside of our planet and going to jump home, okay? No amount of money could get Jay up there. <laughs> it was when they're going through their test. Do you got your helmet? Yeah. Do you got your boots? Yeah. Do you have nine minutes of air? They're spending like a half a billion dollars. They couldn't give them an extra half an hour. But are they sure that it's not ten minutes to get to the planet? You know, eleven. You know, oh my God, we had it slightly wrong. You know, you hit a wind. Um, that just freaked me out. I got nine minutes. It's like. I'm jumping down. Forget the test. Um, so really, know your limits in business because that's what's going to define whether you're successful or not. I would actually do that. <laughs> that's why I'm successful. At the end of the day, the easiest way to rise above in business is by partnering with leaders that are already out there. There is someone else that is non-competitive to you that is talking to your customer every day. There's somebody that's working in that market. There's somebody that knows them. There's somebody that would like to share something new and exciting that they hadn't talked about before. If you can find out who that person is, that will be your greatest ambassador because you'll be able to do something they didn't have, which is innovate. 
and make their old product exciting, and you can ride their coattails to build your space in the market. And the more big names that you're associated with, the more capital that will notice you and, and say, wow, the leader in the industry is working with you, you must have something special. It validates you. So that's how you get marketing uh, shared by really partnering with anchors. And I use the word anchors, if anybody goes to a mall, please visit one why they still exist. Um, the business model is really interesting. The big Macy's, the big Nordstrom, pays no rent. They get free rent because the landlord knows once they're there, the pretzel guy, the cookie guy, the shoe guy, all the other businesses will come in because you're coming to go to those big guys that are marketing to get you there. Nobody's going, oh my god, do I have time to drive across town to get a Wetzel's pretzel? No. <laughs> um, so you really want to go to who can drive the attention. And you can ride their coattails, and I can give chapter and verse of, of many, many examples of this, and I'll come up to a couple a little bit. Um, and the easiest way is to solve the other business's problem first. So what is the need that they have? And I'll give an example that I'll come to uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, I was launching a few years ago a competitor to iTunes for Sony. So being the number two uh, music service out there is kind of tough when you're going up against uh, Apple, the world's greatest marketing machine. And so we were trying to figure out how do you get some excitement and how, who else can you get and what else can you leverage. To make a long story short, um, the largest airline in the country at the time, United, was in bankruptcy. It was coming out of bankruptcy and needed some goodwill and needed some way to get the word out. So why not allow you to use your frequent flyer miles, which Americans had enough to go from here to Pluto and back eight times, to buy music uh, and, and movies and other downloads. So that was the premise. And why not have United, which already has a loyalty program with millions of people in it, to do that in their mailers and show a commercial for it in every flight and put it in the in-flight magazine, you get the idea where this is going. Um, and it's those types of things uh, that you can do with almost any retailer. At the same time, there was a movie out in the theaters called Super Size Me. And so I look for pain points that have nothing to do with my business. Because if somebody's in a lot of pain, there's nothing better than being the salve that makes that pain go away. So I went to McDonald's with an idea of how to make them cool and relevant. Buy this Big Mac and get a free track. Okay? McDonald's would spend $60 million on TV commercials. McDonald's would do signage. I bought in that contract for the tray line. Because if the kids are playing outside, you always read the tray line. And so now you tie up the biggest airline, the biggest fast food chain, which reaches over 100 million people. They're spending all the marketing to launch your service. We had 20 million paying customers our first week. Mm. My cost of marketing, zero. And when you're pitching a business, at the beginning of my career, I used to come up with these great solutions for Ford or for IBM or wherever I was going into. Not really important. Just solve for the person in the meeting. How can you make that one person's life easier? And you'll, you'll do better. Now, I'm in an ad-supported business, so this is a little bit of, of, of heresy. Certain businesses, it makes sense to advertise. For most startups, advertising is a huge expense that you would not be able to show an ROI on. You can't really show an ROI on generalized branding. I'm taking SEO and, and those very specific things out of the mix when I say advertising. PR, on the other hand, nobody buys a magazine to look at the ads. PR is what people read and focus on every single day, okay? So, a couple of things that you never, <coughs> never knew about PR. Why do you pick a PR agency? And those that have sat through me meetings before don't get to speak. What's the number one thing you're looking for when you hire a PR agency? Let's be interactive. Somebody give a shout. It's brave. Well, the ability to penetrate the market and understand, you know, how to sell your brand? That's very helpful, but no. <laughs> Relationships. Oh, getting warmer. Relationships with who? Your target audience. No. Oh, no. no, no. Press, please. Press. 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 That used to be in the day when you knew who the press was in a world of 12,000 bloggers. <laughs> I just did a press conference in, in, in uh, Vegas. 450 people showed up for shrimp. Um, you know, how many of them actually matter? You know, Walt Mossberg showed up, but you know, I don't know who the other people were. No. Last, last one. Everybody want to take it? Your other clients. Ah, oh, 
Nobody tipped you off on that? No. That's the answer. So you got this idea. You're a little startup. You say, God, if only the CMO of Coke knew about this, how could I get to the CMO of Coke? Hire their PR firm. They're traveling with them every day. Hire them to do your company, and then one day it's going to go, wow, you know, Coke should know about you. Really? <laughs> this occurred to me. <laughs> so right now we're in the process of, of um, making the, uh, my company very visible, uh, making the decision, do we take it the full mile and, and, and run it, or do we uh, uh, sell out? And uh, visibility is key. We're already growing organically about as fast as, as, as we can imagine. So how, what do you do on, on the PR front? So I'll just give you the past week, okay? Super Bowl Sunday, have players moving out with fans. The Monday after was the Oscar uh, lunch where they have all the nominees. So we had Hugh Jackman ooing, Naomi Watts was ooing, uh, Bradley Cooper was ooing, uh, Denzel Washington was ooing. Tuesday was New York Fashion Week. We had Victoria's Secret models ooing, Valentine's Day tips. Um, I don't remember what the tips were, but it was a good ooing. Um, Wednesday we had uh, uh, Clinton and Will I Am. I mean, you get the idea, okay? Now, it takes relationships time and different trading and everything, but at the end of the day, it's go big or go home. So if you can come up with a clever idea that you can solve problems. In our particular case, I can drive a million, two million people to pay attention, to go to a movie, to switch channels on TV. I can make a lot of things happen, and I'll be the tooth fairy and trade that all day long for people that can help me. And that's what PR is really about. It's really coming up with clever ideas that bring several people's needs together to reach the same audience, and hopefully on somebody else's dime. Um, so, just to talk on, on a couple examples. So when we did the uh, McDonald's thing, uh, we shot a, a commercial. McDonald's, if you don't know this, is the world's greatest marketing company. Absolutely. Uh, they do not actually make the hamburgers. The franchisees do. You know, They don't make the food. That's done locally. They make the marketing. That's their, that's their sole business, so they're really, really good at it. You want to hire somebody to do a TV commercial? Nah, you can get somebody. You want to hire the best people? McDonald's already has them. So they were shooting a commercial, and they had it all worked out and everything. And I went to them and said, you know what? I think we could take it to the next level by putting Justin Timberlake in it, just as a cameo. And I happen to know, having run music companies, that he was just getting out of boy band and thought that he could be a solo hip-hop white rapper. <laughs> Last guy that successfully was good at that was named Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Didn't go so well. He was nervous, didn't know how great his talent was, so he needed exposure. So suddenly you have the right star at the right time, working for the right price, and it all comes together. So it's really just put layer and layer. We talked about uh, launching uh, with United Airlines. Well, so we got all this PR, but what are they going to write in the article? What's, what's the hook that gets a consumer to care about it? Why not do the first concert in the sky at 30,000 feet? and have Charlotte Pro perform a concert from Chicago to LA, fill the plane with press, shoot it with nine cameras, edit it on laptops, and have it make the evening news by the time the plane lands. 600 front page stories, load up, total cost, nothing. So these are things that you can do by sheer force and will that can drive attention and revenue. Number four, which we, we talked on, but really zero in on, who knows your customer? If you're really committed to taking someone's hard-earned cash to launch your business, you should be talking to dozens of potential customers and really getting to know who is that user. Not like, uh, I think it's people that eat, right? Um, what is their lifestyle? What are the trends? What are the things? What are the insights that you, you can get? and who's already working with them because the problem already existed before you came along. And what you really have to do is say, how are they solving it? An investor, if you're looking for venture capital, is looking for a 10x return. So your solution can't be some incremental solving, right? Right? 
Um, you drive, ride one horse you can get from New York to California in six months. We'll do a stagecoach with four horses and get you there in three months. That wouldn't get venture capital today. I'll get you a plane and I'll get you there in a few hours. That's what they're looking for. And when people help you along the way, pay for those leads. So at the beginning of my career, I'm 22, 23 years old, put the first video on a computer, we're trying to figure out why, and corporate training was the, the big idea. So we figured out how to do corporate training and, and who's the customer going to be. Again, I know no one, don't have any funding, and I'm reading a newspaper article one day that to compete with the Japanese that were taking over Detroit, um, Ford was going to come out with bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, just like all your foreign cars did. The problem was, they knew that when you took your car in to be repaired, half of all parts at a repair shop were good parts being replaced with good parts. Meaning, it was trial and error. So they took out the carburetor, it was fine, they put in another one, but you were paying for it, so they had known and they put another thing done. So now, if Ford's paying for those, Ford's going to lose $600 million a year, unless their training gets better. Well, now I have a pain point. Now I've got a big company. Now I got a company that's thousands of miles away that's been doing things the same way since Henry handed a wrench to the weapon. Okay? How are you going to get in with a newfangled computer and a touchscreen to people that are, you know, get 40,000 pages of documentation? Huh? The good thing about being a young entrepreneur is you don't know any better. You just keep going forward until somebody says you can't go any further. But I needed a way in. So I hired two people following the same thing. One, I hired the retired football coach of Michigan State, because everybody's football fan in Detroit, and everybody would want to meet him. And I got into every meeting in that city, and they talk about the games from this year and that year, and the kid that did the thing, and they go, was he here? Oh yeah, here, give him some business. But to maintain that relationship, I found the sales guy who sold fabric to the big three, because there's fabric in this floor, there's fabric in the seats, there's fabric wrapped around engine parts, I don't know what it is, but he's been whining and dining people for years. Fast forward to today, I'm in an ad business where of the $130 billion spent in the U.S. last year on brand advertising, only 3% was spent in digital, mobile, and social combined. TV gets the lion's share. So if I'm going to be hiring people to sell, I'm not hiring a digital person. We have enough digital people in the company. I'm going to hire people that have the TV relationships to move the TV budget. Why not go after the big portion instead of the appetizers? So, find the right people, get into the right places. Number three, we're getting to the top three. This is the most common mistake that businesses make. Groupon, I'll let you come into my restaurant for half price. Then you'll come back and pay full price. Why? I came in there because I thought it was worth $5. It was worth $10, I would have come in before Groupon. It doesn't make sense. At the end of the day, come up with other things to give away but margin. Because clawing back that margin is never going to happen. It is the hardest thing to change a consumer's behavior when they have that. And proof of that is, how many of you drink orange juice in the morning? Okay? Orange juice, some type of juice. It's good for you. <laughs> anyway, they came in those big cardboard containers our whole entire life. And now they're in these really cute bottles. Anybody know why? The bottle's the same price as the cardboard thing, but it's about 20% less ounces. So rather than raise their prices, they're just giving you less, but they maintain their margin. Okay? So if that works for packaged goods, if that works for everybody, this is what you really have to do. So <laughs> figure out something. And I actually saw a, 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 a sign that, that proved this to the nth degree in, in a store. Um, there's a store for $125 that will take Windows 8 off of your new PC. <laughs> now right now you can add it with a coupon that you can find by just Googling for $15. They can't give it away, but somebody came up with the business of taking it off because you needed a new machine and you didn't want it. So really focus on that. Ah, another one of my favorite pithy ones. So if you follow me on Twitter, you get some serious and some pithy. Uh, for those in the cheap seats, 
Money doesn't bring you happiness, but it enables you to look for it in more places. <laughs> this one took me forever to learn, and I have to admit, I am your typical ethnocentric American. Unless we bombed it, I don't know where it is. Um, I spent most of my career doing domestic business. It's a big market. You can make a ton of money in this country. Um, Post-World War II, we had the largest GDP. We had the heaviest growth rates. So everything's fine and dandy. And for my generation, it's fine to speak one language. Thank God the rest of the world learned that that language is English, or I would be sitting here. Um, but it turns out many other countries are much easier to get into, to take over, to expand from, to make a base. So really, don't be afraid to think globally. When you look at, if you're doing something in mobile, look at countries like Singapore and South Korea. You put up one antenna and the whole country's on 4G. How does that change usage patterns? We're all going to learn and do the same way, with some slight differences, but if you can start seeing where some markets are ahead, where you can bring that knowledge, there's an imbalance between the speed at which new technology uh, dissipates and many fortunes have been made by just taking advantage of the imbalance. Worth a guy named Jerry Mundy years ago. And he came from a frozen wasteland that no one's ever heard of called Canada. <laughs> and I say that because most people don't even think that that's our number one trading partner, that it's a big country, you know, a lot of land, there's more than just Eskimos and ice. And what he would do is he would come down to the U.S. and go to U.S. companies and say, can I have the Canadian rights to your product? And McDonald said yes. And one of the big three auto makers said yes. And a whole bunch of other smaller companies. And it turned out that's like giving away the show. Um, when I was in package software, my first company that I sold, I got a letter one day in the mail from Italy. And my kids were collecting stamps, so I paid attention to it. And there was a $5,000 check from a company I never heard of. We would like to buy the exclusive rights to your product for Italy. And I'm like, how much money did I make in Italy last year? I don't know. My product's even in Italy. Cash the check. Great. We found money. That's not how an international rollout should go. So really, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've now been involved in digital businesses in 30 countries. And it is fascinating to me how easy, how small, and the one difference is we have an entrepreneurial mindset in America. Whether you grew up with I Love Lucy, whether you grew up with Bart Simpson, The Honeymooners, Ralph Brampton, the idea that you can come up with a crazy idea and fail, that's good for you for trying. It's better to have failed than to live the regret of never having tried. That's the American ethos, and we get to export that all over the world. In other markets, you fail, they dig up your ancestors and crush their skulls. Um, you bring shame for generations. I mean, it is amazing the cultural difference of our no fear of failure. Um, one of the first uh, of, of my friends that I worked with to, to hit the, the, the billionaire mark, his first business was this really dumb idea. What if we hooked up computers to traffic lights and we could make traffic move better in cities? And Bill Gates went bankrupt. Business failed. He was ahead of his time, and municipalities couldn't understand what he was selling. His second one, Microsoft, did a lot better. But his first idea was spot on. But there was no, I'm giving up because I failed. In other markets, that's a lot harder. So partnering with somebody in another market where you can bring that expertise that drive the access to venture capital, some of the things that they may not have. And they may have a very tight ruling class where one family controls the telco or the TV stations or whatever um, that can allow you to grow uh, faster. So, number one, and this is the real key, companies don't make decisions. You are not selling Twitter, you are not selling Facebook a new idea, you're not selling Sears a new idea or Shell Oil or whoever you're going after. You just sell that one person across the desk. And for the most part, your idea is probably not going to change the future of Coca-Cola. Okay? But your idea might give that person a promotion. Might make them differentiate on next Wednesday's marketing meeting. Might give them something new to do to satisfy one of their clients. I mean, there's people in all these film studios that each new movie, and there's a new movie coming out every week, somebody on their marketing team has to raise their hand and say, 
I'm doing something that we've never done before. Because that director wants to hear. They're going to spend 90% of their budget the same way, but they're going to be spending half their time showing the director how personalized that attention is to their picture and what they're doing. Imagine instead of getting on a call in June and the call just starting, <coughs> being in the call, Star Trek style. <laughs> Opening in July, J.J. Abrams apparently. Um, so just coming up with something that satisfied that one person, because at the end of the day, today's corporate world is completely driven by self-preservation. Dell didn't go private because it's a fun thing to do. Um, they did it to survive. And so if you can figure out how that person is bonused, how they are measured, what their KPIs are, spend as much time in your meeting listening as talking, and it will be tremendously more successful. Because the real interesting thing is, in nearly 30 years of doing this, the vast majority of my negotiations between big companies, money is the last thing that comes in the conversation. And I'll give you one closing example on the, on the story that we talked about, because it was a great one. So, go to McDonald's, you're gonna get a free track of music, McDonald's is gonna pay, they're getting so many tracks. You know, there's a lot of argument down to the pennies of what they're gonna pay per track of music and what that loss could be and what if too many people redeem and <coughs> the artists and everything's figured out, and, you know, finally worked out, program's ready to go, all done got it through the Sony board, they got it through the McDonald's board, we're all ready to go. And then they just casually mentioned, and you know, we take out insurance on these things just in case that too many people come. Because we have this one for the Olympics in Los Angeles, that you get a free burger with every gold medal, and the Russians didn't show up, and there were too many gold medals, and we lost $55 million. And so, Lloyd's in London gives us this policy, and it's been a number of years, but I want to say the policy was somewhere around $10 million. So, You'll pick up half of it, and we'll pick up half of it, and we're, you know, ready to launch in a couple days. Five million dollars. Nobody told me I had to write a check for five million dollars. I don't have authority to write a check for five million dollars, and I'm not going back to the board, my boss, and everybody else on five million dollars. What do you do? You do what any entrepreneur does. You deconstruct your problem and you sit there. You sit there and say, wait a second. They're going to pay ten million dollars to Lloyd's to insure this thing. Sony's bigger than Lloyd's. We'll insure it. You write me the check for $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> now I go back to my boss and say, man, yeah, this changed the contract. Everything I told you were getting done for free. Blah, blah, blah. I made an extra $5 million. What's my bonus? <laughs> so if you can just figure out how it works, you'll always come out ahead. And that's the joy of doing this. This is why I still love doing it. It's always fun, it's always new. And the pace of change is faster than it's ever been because you're now one click away from billions of people. Another billion people <coughs> on the internet, mostly through mobile, over the next year. A hundred million tablets sold in the last 10 quarters. The world has fundamentally shifted completely to start all over again. And how fun to be a part of that, and I wish you all the best with your new ventures. Thank you.